Well, I'm glad you guys are all here. Like I said, this is one of my favorite classes because it's just like low key. Um, we're just gonna have a lot of discussion. It's gonna be a, a, a class where we get to participate with one another. You can stop me and ask questions. So it's not like Bible study where um, you know someone's just giving a teaching. It's, it's more than that. It's more of a classroom, more of um, just you being able to just um, dig in. We want to dig in together and just talk about some of the principles of, of leading. And um, so I love that. So um, how many of you have ever, have never taken any type of leadership class before? Okay, so quite a few of you have never taken a leadership class before. How many of you have taken a few leadership classes in your day? And then how many of you have extensive leadership training? Okay, so good. So we're, um, so this is going to be really good. And, um, and so I just want you guys to just be able to um, feel free just to talk. and Because I know in Bible study it's kind of like, oh, we have to be quiet and let someone talk. So... I want to be able to hear from you guys, and, and we will. So we're going to kind of like, as we go through the study, we'll be like wrestling with some doctrine and challenging and stretching ourselves into like, okay, what, what's the next thing God has for me? How is he going to stretch me in that way? Um, this first class, because um, the women's ministry training class is eight weeks, um, I wanted to make this eight weeks, so I kind of stretched it out. So today I'm going to just kind of get you familiar with your book, your binder, um, kind of go over, give you an overview of the class, an overview of the book to help you what we're going to cover and, um, and how the class works. So the class is designed to help you strengthen your leadership ability personally. So first we want to strengthen our, our leadership ability personally through the study of his word and in ministry and then through some practical training. So as we go through, it's not only this, um, this becoming a Titus II woman book, which we'll go through, but it's also a bunch of other resources and discussions and things that we've added in to help us um, become a better leader. So um, we'll be doing that. We're going to go through a few like nuts and bolts of Reliance Church in the midst of it all. We'll go through a few things that are um, just unique to our particular church. And then, um, and then as we go through the book, um, and you all have the book, right? Okay. And you all got your binder with the uh, workbook insert. Okay, so um, your syllabus is there, and it kind of lists out everything that um, you will need in order to get through the study. And so the two will work in conjunction with each other. Um, and you'll see how that works. So if you want to grab your book, I just want to um, map out a few things. So in the Martha piece, she also wrote The Excellent Wife. I don't know if you know that, but um, same author that wrote The Excellent Wife. In her introduction, she says in the opening pages of this book, she says, it seemed to me that every Christian woman, regardless of age or marital status, should aspire to become a Titus II woman. It also seemed to me that most churches today were woefully lacking in the training of these ladies. They may have organized women's function, but there seems to be few, if any, older women who are discipling younger women biblically as required by Titus 2, 3 through 5. Do you guys uh, agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, someone grab Titus 2, 3 through 5 and, and read it for us just so we can be reminded of what that says. Whoever gets it first, just raise your hand and I'll... Okay, go ahead. Um, the older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Okay, so that's a pretty clear mandate to us as women of the church. And um, as we go through this, you'll see that that's how we have geared our ministry. And um, so that's why we have classes like this, because we want to be able to train and be able to take God's word and then put it into 
uh, the context of our church and in our ministry. So <clears throat> with that, um, it's our desire here at Reliance to train everyone to maturity in Christ. And if you guys are, you know, I, there's so probably some note pages somewhere if you guys want to take notes. But it's our desire to train everyone to the maturity in Christ so that we can be influences in our families, yes, with our friends and in our communities and beyond. Because as we go out, we're the lights of the world, right? We want to be able to be that influence. And how can we be that influence? I, I can't tell you how many Christians, and, and I've, I've been like this too, where I'll walk my walk. But telling somebody about Jesus, like, that's just, like, on another planet for me. It's, like, that that's such a scary thing to me that I, that I just wanted to have that for myself. But we're to go out and to make disciples and to be that example um, in those ways. And how can we do that? Um, a leader for the gospel and a representative of Christ to a lost and dying world. And that's our hope through some of these classes that, yeah, we get filled in you know fall through spring in our bible studies we get filled personally with the with the word we we get we get saturated with the word but then we're to go out and we're to be those witnesses um, to those people around us. So some things that you'll learn in this class. Um, like I said, it's not just about the book. Um, we have a lot of resources that we're going to go through in the workbook. And as we go through them, you don't have to worry about like what order they're in or whatever. I will tell you, like, okay, next week I want you guys to do this, and it's in your workbook, and um, we'll figure that out as we go. Um, we're going to learn how to share the gospel easily. How many of you, like, you freak out if you're just like, I need to share the gospel? And how many times have you been in a situation, and I have to raise my hand first, where God's like, I want you to share the gospel with that person? You're like, um, I can't. I mean, don't you just, like, lament over, like, those times you're just like, I totally blew it. The Lord asked me to step out, and I was so scared I didn't do it. And so I want during this class, I want to show you like an easy way that you can share the gospel with somebody. Um, we're going to work on what's called the two-minute testimony. And that's another thing that I think is really, really important to our faith is that we learn, we predetermine what we're going to say when we have an opportunity to share with somebody to share our testimonies. And we can't keep people captive. Like you run into someone in the store. You know how it's been. You run into someone in the store. I don't know. I just have that personality where, like, when I meet people in the first 30 seconds, they talk to me like they've known me for 30 years, and everything comes out. Like, is there anybody that just, no, okay, there's, there's a few. Like, I don't know what it is, but I'm a magnet for that kind of person. It's just, like, out with it. It just... So when you're in those situations, like at the store, the grocery store, and you think, okay, this person needs a changed life. Well, how then do I say, let me tell you about Jesus, you know what I mean, without being awkward? Like, my son always says, shake off the awkward. <laughs> like, <laughs> Got to shake off the awkward. So we want to be able to learn what we're going to say. And you know how it is. When you know that you have something predetermined to say, then you can go into it, right? Then you have the ability to be able to say, well, let me tell you that I felt just like you. Maybe someone's sharing with you, and you say, you know what? But God changed my life. And in two minutes, I can tell somebody the story of my redemption. I will be able to say, you know what, before Christ, I was a mess. I was doing drugs. I was drinking. I was sleeping around with guys, this, that, the other. And then God got a hold of me. How did he get a hold of me? That's a, that's a point where you always, in your testimony, want to be able to put the gospel in. Because he died on the cross for my sins, because he gave his life, I was able to be transformed. And now I'm walking in the newness of life. And so you learn how to give your own personal story with the gospel in like two minutes. And if you plan that out and you rehearse it, it becomes kind of a natural part of who you are. And you don't have to say it like, well, you know, John 3.16, you know what I mean? Like it's not, like it's just a natural part of conversation. And you can learn how to say that naturally. So we're going to work on how to put those together and how to present those. And some of you will be able to um, come up here and, and share your two-minute testimony um, with the class. And I think that's a good idea, too, to, to have to share 
um, with it. And then it also works because as a leader, then you could see like actually how hard it is to be up here. <laughs> That's a good lesson as well. We're also going to go through a counseling workshop in the midst of this, I think like week four or five um, on our YouTube channel. And if you guys don't, how many of you know where our YouTube channel is? Well, how many of you don't know where it is? Okay, so um, on YouTube, if you go into Reliance Women, I think, Reliance Women, um, you'll see a slide just like this. Week four or five, um, that slide has a counseling workshop, and in your workbooks, you'll have a, a worksheet to fill out, so there'll be homework on that week, and we'll go through a counseling workshop just discussing, like, what is biblical counseling? How do we give biblical counseling? What is what is it, and what isn't it? And so she'll take you through a very quick workshop um, through, it's a, a, a pastor's wife from... Uh, in the Las Vegas area, I think Henderson, but she did a workshop at a pastor's wife's conference and it was probably one of the best workshops that condensed counseling that I've that I've heard in a long time. So um, each class obviously is an hour and 15 minutes. We have until about 10, 15. So we'll have some good time for just discussion and, and asking questions. Um, it'll include like an overview as we start reading the book and going through it. I'll do a little bit of an overview and then in the book, if you guys, um, I don't know if you've, you've probably haven't had a chance yet, but if you look um, in the book um, at the table of contents, you'll see that it has, wait, where's the table of contents? It's right up front. So each one, it's kind of um, broken down in parts. So part one, part two, part three, part four. So the first week, we'll read um, the first three chapters, but that's like 17 pages. It has some study questions at the back of each chapter that we'll go through, and then we'll discuss those answers um, together. So we'll have a discussion. We'll have a question and answer time where you can ask questions about the text, about the study questions. We'll kind of like, um, you know, there'll be some controversial subjects that come up. You know, what about divorce? What about this? What about that? That we can like kind of talk through and, and maybe isn't there some doctrine or something, life issues that you're just not quite settled on? Like, what does the Bible really have to say about this? What, you know, what can I do about this? I had a situation the other day where someone was asking me, there was a, a person that was divorced and he wanted to get remarried, but the divorce wasn't. Um, because of adultery, and the pastor was telling him that he had to stay unmarried or reconcile with his first wife. It got complicated because it was the first wife who initiated the divorce, but they were both Christians. Those are hard questions, right? You look through like 1 Corinthians 7, and it's like, okay, right there, it says like that person should remain unmarried. But man, those are some hard things to tackle. So maybe we'll get to talk through some of those um, harder things in life. Um, some weeks we're going to write a, a summary. I think it's a good practice. And this is optional because some people just don't like to write. But I think writing is a good practice to what you've learned. And so we'll write some summaries. Not, not anything big, maybe 250 words. You can type them. You can handwrite them. Not more than a page. Just of what you've gleaned from your reading and then how you can apply it to your own personal life. So maybe a paragraph on what you've gleaned and a paragraph on um, how you can apply it to your own personal life. And some of those, I'll ask for volunteers to read um, your papers in class and that way we can share because we can learn from each other. You know, maybe someone picked out something in the reading that I didn't think about, but then when they share it, it's like, oh wow, that's a really good point. I need to take a walk with that. So we'll do that. We'll also, um, Let's see, so in your binder, um, if you turn to week, I think it is in, you'll have inserts, it'll say week one, week two. So in week one, you have an example of, the, of a summary. This was for a class I did, so it's probably a little more formal, but it gives you kind of an idea of, do you see it in week one? Try week two. Oh, that's because I put the new form in the front. I was looking at my old one. So it's in week two, summary example. So that just gives you, see, it's not that much. It's like half a page 
of just writing and you can break them into like the first paragraph and then the second. So the first part will be more like a, an actual summary um, where you'll talk about what you learned in, in it and what it said and then the second paragraph will be, you know, as you reflect on it, how you can put it into your own life. So um, any questions so far? You're all tracking? Okay. Um, so let's see, where am I? So we're not going to do a summary for the first three chapters because I kind of wanted to break you in more slowly and you're getting used to the book and the workbook and stuff. So we might pull that in in week three. And then, um, so please read through your syllabus um, like the week before. You're always going to do, so turn to, turn to your syllabus actually while we're talking about it so I can break that down. You're always going to do your homework prior to coming to the class. So uh, let's see week one. So it says we have a book overview and we're going to go through the book. But then week two, see it down there it says read. Um, so you have chapters one through three. And then that will tell you what we're going to do in class. There will be a lecture, some discussion questions. And then it says on week two that you'll have your gift, gift assessments. Um, some of these are just inserts, and you will just go over them in class. If they're homework, I will tell you. So that gift assessment test, so if you turn to, let me see what week we have it in. It might be week two. So week two, turn to your gift assessments test. How many of you have ever taken a gift assessments test? Most of you. Sometimes it's good to do it in a different season in life because it's not like an end all like these are your spiritual gifts and you're never going to have another gift in your whole life. You know what I mean? Like I think God pours out his gifts when we need them and there might be some, some specific things that he's called us to do, but sometimes, you know, there might be a different season where one like takes precedence over another. So um, the instruction guide is there on your spiritual gift assessment. If you see it at the top, it's pretty self-explanatory. You will answer a bunch of questions, and then at the back of the gift assessment um, is the answer key, and you'll write down your scores. And then as you go through the lines, you'll put your totals. Do you see the answer key? So question answers 1, 25, 49, and 73, you'll put the total. And then the next page, so row A, it'll show you, okay, row A is for helps. So then you'll fill in what those are. What I want you to do is like circle three of your top gifts because then as we discuss them, I want to hear from you guys, like, did anything change? Did, you know, what were my top three? Was I surprised by what the Lord showed me in that? Um, some might throw you, you might think, how on earth? For me, I have administrative gifts, but I hate paper. I hate filing paper. Like, Shirley hands me paper, and I literally, like, hand it back. Like, you do not want to give this to me because it's going to end up in the bottom of my car. Like, I have tote bags for everything. Like, I have, I have, like, 15 tote bags and just different things are in them. Like, this tote bag's for this class, and all my stuff is in there. Those are my, that's my filing system. It's my tote bags. But... I can put an event together from start to finish in my head. I can think of the details. I can think of every detail. I can think of from parking to when you leave. I, like I, I don't miss a detail because my head works like that. But it has nothing to do with paper. So I would think, oh, administration, like that's paper, that's secretarial work, but not always. Sometimes it could be planning and processing. And so we might, we might go through that and find some different things. So. Um, let's see where we're at. So you're going to read through those and do those. So next week we will do that, um, that thing. Let me give you, I'm going to give you my cell phone number if you guys want to just jot it down. Because I want you during the week, if you have any questions about the homework or you want to ask any questions, I want to be able to give you that. So it's um, area code 951-290-1706. Do not ask me a question at 3 in the morning. <laughs> like my children, text me. I, oh, I've learned where the do not disturb button is. Because if I tell them don't text me, then it's 50 texts in a row. Like, you know, just to bother me. <laughs> like, stop texting me. <laughs> yeah, that's how that goes. What's that? Not 290-1706. 
And feel free to text me like, I didn't understand this, or what are we doing with this, like just to keep up on, on our homework. So um, I'm up pretty late, probably like 11. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, sometimes I'm up later than that. We're like late night people. Yeah, 10.59, that's it. No more. <laughs> um, every class will build upon the class before. So it's eight weeks. So please try to make a commitment to just being here for the whole thing, like, like you know, continue in it. And as we dig into it, you'll, you'll understand that each one kind of builds on it. Um, if you have to miss a morning class, there's also a night class at six this particular class is also at six so you can come at six like if you can't make it to one of the morning classes that um, will work too so I want to hear from you guys I want to hear some some of you guys uh, share with me like what maybe you hope to gain like why did you take this particular class if you don't raise your hand I'll call on you Okay, so be strengthening. What's the weakness? Have you identified what the weakness is? It just depends on what, the, I guess, depends on what their challenge is, and I want to be able to answer it correctly. So biblical God, counseling. Right. Okay, good. Really yeah. How many of you have been in situations where you're counseling and you're like, this is starting to sound like my opinion. <laughs> like, <laughs> this might not be in the Bible. <laughs> Especially, yeah, <laughs> right, because your emotions get involved, especially if it's a friend. You're just like, you know, you can identify with what they're going through, and you're, and then you start giving counsel. You're like, I need to check with the word and make sure that that's going on. What about somebody else? How about you? Sherry. Right. Let's revisit, like you say, life has changed. There's been a lot more trials since then, and you know, there's a lot more to be gleaned when mm -hmm. you revisit scripture. Yeah. And I think revisiting the same class, taking them over and over and over again. I remember when we were younger and we had kids, like, I literally took parenting classes like at least once every other year. Why? Well, because you forget the material. Even I go through this in teaching it and I go oh man that's so good like I even revisit things over and over and over again that I think oh I totally forgot that to keep something in your mind it's you know repetition is the mother of learning we have to repeat and repeat and repeat and so we get it like kind of ingrained and it becomes second nature yeah anybody else Sophia how about you There you go. Sophia and Ashley were in my Bible college class, and so um, they both aspire to leadership, and so they just continue and continue and continue. And it's so great to see, like, such young ladies be so into wanting to serve the Lord in that way. And they've, they already, I mean, I think about what I was doing at your age, and it's like you already have, you know, just you're so far ahead of the game. And you'll be super effective. And you have a desire to go into women's ministry, right? And to minister to women. Um, was it missionary desire or here? Uh, both. Both. Right, and we've talked about that, just the lack of, um, I, and we've, we've kind of wrestled through that. I don't know if it's that women are just tired or they don't think there's a need 
or uh, I don't know. Let's hear from some of the older ladies working maybe and just tired doing other things. What do you, what's, what do you think? Taking for fam older family members. Some are yes, they are. <laughs> it's just, we're going to have to pray for creative ways to bring it to them. Some, some of us might have to go one on one in somebody's home with them. Others might be able to do groups like this. And that's kind of why I'm always digging in to find new and better ways to do it. Right. Yeah. But this has yeah. been a heart for us for a long time. And all of the above, like we do need groups like this. We need one on one. We need like women to step out, you know, we've talked, I've talked about it with these young girls, you know, is it their responsibility? And I've told them like, you keep pushing and pushing and pushing and until you find, you know, that mentor. But then how do we as older women make ourselves available to the younger girls? Because we are taking care of aged parents. We are d trying to figure out, you know, we still have children and grandchildren. And so it's hard, but I think with a little effort, I think it can be done, like There's you say, creative ways. creative ways to pull it together. How about somebody else? Oh, the mommy and me group can't hear. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, okay. good, so, perfect. So can you pass it around? Yes. yes. <laughs> we have a mommy and me group, so they're in a room with their baby. So just say hi to them. Hi. <laughs> um, so they're in with their baby, so they can't hear the questions, and they want to be a part of the discussion. So I would just say there was a generation break. Some of the older women kind of despise the younger, and the younger can despise the older, and there's some of that too within so that's right. what I, I think sometimes as younger women they think how can an older woman from a different generation like even um, like understand relatable. what I'm going through because I have a different um, things are different now and then I think the older ones maybe would get frustrated with well that's a new generation they think differently they you know they have different challenges and so how do we then come alongside them and go okay yeah it is a different generation but how can I help you because there are some basics mm -hmm. that's why I think networking is so important because um, there's Excuse certain, me. With oh, all this I'm sorry with all the technology and stuff today um, I'm obviously not had to deal with that with my kids there wasn't as much of that around my daughter didn't even have a computer when she started college so it's quite different today and so I referred down to my daughter who's dealing with that now and say what are some things you guys are using and so that networking I think is really crucial mm -hmm. Right, getting to know one another, getting to have times where you have different groups that you can get to know one another, and you know a lot of a lot of mentoring happens organically. Like the Lord just puts you in a room with someone, you meet, you connect, but sometimes it doesn't. And how, as a church, can we handle that? I mean, I look around Sunday mornings, and there's so many young moms in the room. How can I reach each one of them? How can I, you know, how can I train people to reach each one? And and so it's a it, it can be a huge problem, you know what I mean? And and how do we solve it? The mandate's there in Titus 2. The older women are supposed to mentor the younger women and it gives us specific things that we're supposed to mentor in. And we'll see as we go through, you know, why we've set up ministry the way we have to try and kind of combat some of those things, but um, it is a difficulty. Um, what do you think is the, like the, maybe some of you younger, maybe Jessica, you can answer this, but what has been some of the challenges in finding an older mentor? Because, you know, the, the desire's there to have an older mentor, but what's some of the disconnect, I guess? I guess. Um, well, I can't speak for everyone my age, but at least just for me, um, I grew up in a strong Christian background and went to Christian college and kind of have been inculcated in that environment. So, of course, it was always pressed on my brain, oh, find a mentor. You need a mentor if you want to keep growing as a Christian and, you know, as a young wife and as a young mom. So um, <laughs> that's something that I actually did pursue um, avidly for the past few years. Um, and I think the hardest thing for me has been 
like just almost like the social awkwardness of like, okay, God, like who do you want me to ask to be my mentor? Like I, there, there were so many um, hard, hard spells throughout the last few years with like having a new baby and not getting any sleep and postpartum depression where um, it was really tough for me to like break out and uh, get that boldness to go up to somebody and ask them, hey, I'm really struggling. Can you come nice. alongside me? Can you teach me? Can you help me? Like you're a lot wiser than me. You've been all these places before me. And so um, I think a lot of times uh, people who are my age, just they want someone to come up to them and say, hey, can I encourage you? Can we go to coffee? Can I pour into you? Can I, can I teach you? And so um, I think I, I would just, I guess, encourage the older women, um, know your value, uh, know that people like me are really seeking your counsel and uh, you guys to come alongside us. Right. Because you can't breathe. You're like, okay, you know, when you've had a baby and you do, you have suffered from, and many of us have postpartum depression and you're not getting any sleep. The last thing you're thinking about is who could I have to be my mentor? Let me look around the church. You're like, you know, you're like, if you don't get out of my face, I might hit you. Yeah. Like that's more of where you're at in that season of life. So to come alongside of somebody and say, you know, to, for us older women to be able, and how does that happen? How do we even meet the Sophia's and Ashley's and Jessica's of our, our day? We have to be at church. We have to be involved. We have to be in different groups um, where they're hanging out so we can go. I mean, you can't just, I mean, you can, but like Sunday morning, like you look like a young mom. Can I mentor you? Like, <laughs> like, Oh, creepy. <laughs> shake, shake off the awkward. <laughs> um, I also too had an issue where women would talk at me and not mm. come alongside of me. It's like they wanted to fix me, not, hey, can I just help you with this? And you, and sometimes you would feel that condemnation. So that was like another issue that I know That's I dealt really with. Good. So I never really had mentors because those were the women I was always around. And I yeah. want to make sure I'm not that way. So that's kind of... Right. That's such a great point because I think, I mean, there is some things where you're like, how do you balance that? Because there is some fixing that needs to go on. So you have to have that relationship where... But I think it's in building the relationship first so that then you can speak into their lives and then maybe with permission, like I will ask someone, will you give me the permission to speak into your life right now? I might ask them permission be beforehand because you know, if otherwise, yeah, we can just like, hey, I know what your problem is and I can fix it. And it's like, oh, I don't wanna hear from you. Ashley, wait, it's coming, Vanna's coming. Um, as well, it's loud. Um, being a younger woman, um, I would say to you guys, you guys as Jessica, um, you guys do have a huge value, and um, we look up to you guys in so many ways. For some who also may not have had that spiritual leader as, you know, such as a mother growing up, it's a little bit harder. So with coming in, you know, and wanting to get involved in church or just grow in the word, um, you want to hear from an older woman. And I know for me at times, it's you kind of feel like you're a burden, so you don't want to reach out. You don't. It, it's hard. It's really hard. For me, it was hard to really just even open up. Um, and I just want to say at this church, uh, many of you guys have been a huge blessing, been here since um, December, and the way that you guys um, have reached out to Sophie and I, we've talked so many times about this, uh, we've never witnessed it. Uh, the way that you guys have just automatically just wrapped your arms and brought us in or just made us feel comfortable, it made a huge difference. Um, so oftentimes, as younger women, we're, we don't want to be a burden, maybe. Um, it's hard to reach out, but yeah, we are crying for it. We're, we're yearning, but we're longing for it. Um, so like she said, know, know your value. You guys have a huge purpose. Um, God, you know, has given you guys so many things and, and planted so many things in you, and we're hungry for that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely hard to, to reach out. So there's a balance between both. I think, you know, for us, we need to step up and say, Hey, I need help, which is very hard to do. Um, for me it was, and I'm trying to get over that, but, um, yeah, I just want to say also too, with this church specifically, you guys have, um, God just really used many of you guys already to just really reach out. So, 
that's kind of just what I have to say. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe we could solve the universal problem. <laughs> In our class, we'll just solve the problem of this mentor and, you know, student relationship and how we can come up with ways, even in our own church, you know, like maybe we have ideas about like, hey, how can we come up with a better way to reach people? I like to do groups because to me, one-on-one, -on -one, it does, it it's very time consuming. And so to me, like if I can get a group, if I'm going to teach someone how to cook, to me, I'm like, if I can get a group of 50 girls in the room, let's teach them how to cook all at once. You know what I mean? Like, and how to mentor. How many of you, like you did not have a Christian influence as a, for a mom? Like it's, it's a huge amount, right? Like in, in, in the church, I think that not many of us had that spiritual example as a mom, but even if you did, you need to go outside of that because even if you've had that, you still need that help as an adult because it's different having a spiritual mom as a kid. They're you're getting raised and they're growing you up and trying to make you, you know, into a, a good individual to live in society. But then you have different challenges as you become a mom. And I mean, there's some things that you couldn't even talk to your mom about. You know, you now have a husband and you've got all those the issues that you deal with within marriage and within parenting, um, and you just need that guidance. So. Um, that's anybody for a different reason, like you took the class for some other reason. <laughs> Angel's going to get her workout today. I didn't know why I was taking this class until this very moment. I knew that I needed to come. We've done this before, and I don't feel equipped to mentor or to um, talk to somebody. Even though I can help that person, I don't know how to approach them. When you were talking about how hungry you all are, hey, then let me f feed you. Right. Because right. I want to do that, but I hold myself back um, not thinking I'm equipped enough. I, I came across the CD that we listened to, that mentoring, and I listened to it again, and I thought, this is, I know I keep coming back to women's ministry for a reason, and, and, right. and I think I keep stopping myself because I don't think I'm equipped, and I think mm -hmm. um, the reason I'm taking it is to feel equipped, you know, right. so yeah, well, that's awesome. That's a really hard, go ahead. Uh, I think, oh. yeah. Wait, wait, hold that thought. I think the person that's doing the mentoring often feels inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say, I was at Calvary Costa Mesa. They actually had a, a complete total program where you filled out cards. There was classes. You filled out cards. The funny thing is um, they said, okay, now pray about if you should be the mentor or the person mentoring, and you actually were able to pick both. You could do both. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem that they had was a lot of the mentors, they felt so inadequate, like mine was a German mm -hmm. lady, and she had problems speaking English. It was, But she was a great, she had really good gifts as far as homemaking and cooking and all that, but she, was, she felt so insecure right. in the mentoring part that it, it was really hard for her to even call me on the phone. I like had to do all the phone, I had to call and everything. Right. But when I had my daughter, it was great and she was so happy because she was able to show me all these things because that was her thing. She was able to do that and she, right. she would bring food and everything. But the interesting thing is after the whole thing, um, this whole program they did, they were amazed how few of the connections really, um, like were of the Lord because it, they felt like it was forced mm -hmm. more than the spirit, you know? Right. I mean, there were some great connections that were made, but right. but they never did figure, they were like, maybe we need to change this because just 
Yes. You, there's a way you can try and figure it all out, yeah. but it seems to me like a lot of the connections, what you were saying, kind of happened spontaneous. Like right. I had a, a, a Mexican lady that I used to call her all the time. I still do. I call her my tightest two woman because she, she, it just happened naturally, you know. And Anyone that can make tortillas by hand. <laughs> yeah, and she does. The tightest two woman. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah, say yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, that that's a huge thing because as, as, mentors we don't often feel equipped enough and we need to be equipped and there are steps that we can take to be equipped and so we have to take those steps and be as equipped with the word I never want to sit down with anyone ill-equipped I don't want to sit down but are we doing anything to equip and then the other side of that coin is we're never going to be equipped enough and we just have to step out in faith and trust that the Lord is putting us together. And there are flaws in the system when we try to force um, things. And we do we do have those cards because it's like, well, what else are we going to do? Some people want to be mentored and they need to find a mentor and it's not happening. So we try our best to match people up. But what we have at in our churches, the problem is we don't have enough mentors. I can find students everywhere, and sometimes we get backed up on people wanting to be mentored one-on-one, -on -one, um, but they can't because we don't have enough mentors. And then the danger in not having equipped mentors is then people will go to someone who maybe shouldn't be mentoring, and they'll ask, will you mentor me? And then as a pastor's wife, I come in, it's like, uh, you know what I mean? Like there's some times that, you know, people are, are not equipped at all or not hardly walking with the Lord and trying to mentor and bring along somebody else. And so there's some, I mean, there's some dangers in the mix uh, of it all, but that kind of leads me into, I just want to talk to you guys for a few minutes before, um, we go about, um, about just planning for harvest and we're talking about this idea of being equipped and this will kind of speak to you i heard uh, this quote it says that um, you're never a failure until you quit and it's always too soon to quit and that's such a great thing for us to be encouraged by because it's true like we never um, if we never quit, if we never give up, if we never stop being equipped, if we never stop coming to classes like this, if we never um, stop sitting at the Lord's feet, then, you know what I mean? Like, we're not going to be a failure. The only thing in failure is if we quit. Um, Ted and I, we were counseling this young, yes. The quote, um, you, you are never a failure until you quit, and it's always too soon to quit. Ted and I were counseling this young ministry couple once, and we were sitting there talking with them, and they were just about done. Um, the ministry had chewed them up and, and spit them out, and they're having a really hard time and just feeling really defeated and feeling like failures, and um, and they just wanted to give up. They wanted to throw in the towel. They're like, this is too hard. We can't do this. Maybe we missed God's call. Maybe we're not cut out for this. You know, I, I don't know what we're doing here, and and so they were asking us as an older ministry couple, like, don't you ever feel like this? And we literally like giggled out loud and we just looked at each other and we were like, we call that Monday. Like, <laughs> right? Don't you just want to quit on Mondays? Like every Monday, I'm like, that's it. I'm quitting. Or there's like a certain time on the calendar that um, comes like once a month and you can circle it and like, okay, you have the worst husband on that week, you, you have the worst kids, like we're not bad, but everybody else is like horrid, and you want to quit on, on those days, but if we um, think about a harvest, and you think about what it takes to get a harvest, it takes hard work, so we know that when you have a harvest, like let's say you're planting a field, or, or you know, fruit trees, or whatever, you have to plant it, right, you can't just, a harvest just doesn't come, I know I can't harvest anything. Like, I kill everything. Like, I do not have a green thumb at all. Um, and so for me to, like, actually plan a harvest, I would really have to do some planning. So anytime we think about those things, like, before there is a reward, there must be labor. You guys know this. I mean, you think about dieting or exercising. There's always a labor before a reward. 
And so before you have a harvest, you have to plant. Um, Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up or if we do not lose heart. And that, I think, isn't that one of our biggest challenges is losing heart in the things of God? Like we start going like gangbusters and then you lose heart. You start going down this good path, you lose heart. How many of us, we've started a Bible study and four weeks in, like we just like lose steam, we lose gas. That's what this verse in Galatians is telling us. Do not grow weary. That means exhausted, like giving up. Don't grow weary in doing good. Because it is going to reap a harvest. And that's what this class is. This, is. this is the planting season. This isn't the harvest season. There's planting seasons and there's harvest seasons. This is the planting seasons. And there's different um, seasons. And so planting is hard work. So, you know, the harvest will be out there. This is the classroom. This is where we get out our notebooks and we get out our Bibles and we wrestle through some of the stuff and we take notes and we ask God, change me, mold me, shape me, teach me so that then I can go out and see the harvest that you're going to produce. But this is the part where we work. It's like that with any class, any college class you take. What do you have to do? You know what I mean? You have to work hard. You have to do the assignments. You have to learn. You have to sit through the long lectures. Why? Because you're trying to reap a harvest at the end of that and you're trying to learn um, so planting, it's systematic. There's a systematic way that you can go about planting a harvest. You know what I mean? Like first you're going to till the ground. Then you're going you're to get the soil ready. Then you're going to implement stuff into the soil. Then you're going to plant the seeds. And then there's the maintenance. It requires maintenance and watering and weeding and oversight and managing. Those are all things that, that a good harvest needs in order to be produced um, and so after all that hard work of the season think about the farmer getting up early and having to plant and water and care and maintain for months and then he reaps the harvest because he didn't grow weary in doing good and that's the only difference between those you see people who have a lot of fruit in their lives and you think gosh I I want that I want the fruit that they have look at the hard work that they've done to get there I guarantee you it's there I guarantee you every step of the way that you see someone that's producing fruit they've have hard work attached to that fruit and diligence and they didn't grow weary in doing good and they didn't lose heart and then they got to see the harvest so we'll reap a harvest and that harvest is going to benefit what it's going to benefit us personally it's going to benefit our families because we're going to be growing spiritually. It's going to benefit the community and our neighbors and the people we come into contact. And then it's going to benefit the church because we're called to serve one another in the body of Christ so that God may be glorified. We don't get to enjoy the fruit without that harvest. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not grow weary, they shall walk and not faint. So the key there is waiting on the Lord. If we wait on the Lord, we don't grow weary, and we're not going to faint. So we have to wait on the Lord. So in this time when we're pushing through, like when I'm pushing through hard seasons, it's like I always go back to Galatians 6, 9, and I always think of that verse, like just wait on the Lord, just wait on the Lord push through this season because we do have hard seasons I think every single one of us like has those seasons where it's like I can't do this I, I can't go on I can't and you know you make those bad decisions when you're really stressed right like at the height of your stress you're just like that's it I'm out like you push me you push me you push me uncle you know what I mean? That's when we tap out because, but if we would just push through those stressful seasons, they come and go, don't they? Like if you just kind of like, okay, this is logically in my head, this is a tough season, this seems really stressful, but I know this too shall pass. I know that there's a season where this isn't going to be the case anymore. So um, 
there's a harvest for the for this class and for the work that you put into it. God says his word does not return void. Um, so in hard work's the only way that we're going to be able to get there. Now, often I want to harvest without any work, right? Like I would like muscles without actually having to lift weights. <laughs> Like, have you seen those, um, all the things on, like, they have all those exercise things on the TV guide and stuff where you don't have to do anything to, you know, um, lift weights. You're just going to get the things that you want. So we're going to get out of this class. We're going to have a harvest of personal spiritual growth, and we're going to have a harvest of being equipped. You're talking about, you know, being equipped. That's what happens in classes like this, that you're going to walk away feeling, okay, I'm more equipped now to talk to somebody else because I've sat in the classroom, and now I get to go out into the field. And so this is that, that hard work. Ephesians, can someone read Ephesians 4, 11, and 12? Got it? Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. The responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church in Christ. Okay, so that verse is saying that, that God gave gifts to the church in apostles, pastors, teachers. I don't know what the other one was, something. Um, prophets gave those gifts to the church to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. That's, um, that's God's design, is for us to equip you for then for you to go out and do work in the ministry. So three encouragements I want to give you in planning a harvest. It's plan for your harvest. When you, when you say, you know, I think about you, Liz, saying, well, I'm not equipped. Well, this is part of that. You're planning to be equipped. So plan to be equipped. Plan that harvest. You'll be tempted to give up. You'll be, uh, you, I guarantee you through this process, several of you will say, I can't do it. I can't keep up. I can't do it. Remember Galatians 6, 9. Number two, stay focused. Just keep your focus like, nope, the Lord called me here. I want to stay with it. I want to see it through. And then push through, number three, push through the tough days. Sometimes that's really difficult to do. So plan for your harvest, stay focused, push through the tough days. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. That immovable means firmly persistent, always abounding, um, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Anytime we do work for the Lord, anytime we learn about him, anytime we glean information for his cause, it's never in vain. It, it, it's never in vain to do the work of the Lord. There are a lot of other things we could give our time to, but this is the most important thing, the most important thing, and we see it in our world, and um, for any of you taking care of aging parents, there's like a real sharpness of this life is short. This life is really a vapor. When, when the Bible says that life is like a vapor, it really is. We're here for a little while, and then we're gone. And I want to make the most of my time here on earth. I want to be able to reach as many as people as I can reach for the gospel. I want to help people grow as much as I can. And so when, when I feel like I'm getting tired, it's like I'm, I'm fine tired. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep try, pressing through, helping people grow. Uh, if I, I mean, I have an eternity to rest in the Lord. <laughs> you know, I want to go in tired. Uh, Psalm 1-2 says, He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season. God will yield your fruit in your season. Its leaf will not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. So God gives us a promise there that, you know, he's going to bring fruit in due season. Um, so we looked at our syllabuses, and we kind of, like, talked about specific homework um, that we'll be completing. So next week, um, we're going to be going through. So go take out your books. And we'll be going through uh, chapters 1 through 3. So you're going to read those and do the study questions. And um, 
Let's see what is up for next week. So she talks about a new philosophy of life in chapter one. Um, chapter two, she's going to go through three areas to mature. That's probably the most important chapter in the book, um, says me. <laughs> um, really great stuff in that chapter about three areas that we have to mature in. Sometimes we're not equipped to mentor because we have a lack of maturity in our own selves that we have to, you know, we might have a maturity in scripture where we don't know God's word. And that's detrimental to us being able to mentor others if we don't know his word. There might be an immaturity in character, and she talks about that. You know, if we have a lack of character, we're not, we maybe know God's word, but we're not applying it to our lives. It's another thing that keeps us from being able to mentor effectively. And then she goes into the third area, service, Learn just that immaturity in what it means to serve the Lord, to give your life's for service. And so she goes into that. And then she's in chapter three, she gives some examples of discipling younger women. So all of that is in store. There'll be some study questions and, um, and we'll do that next week. So any other questions, um, things that you can think about that we can just open up and have a few minutes of discussion. We're going to be out early. So Today, we won't. Next, the next weeks will be like starving for time trying to get through it all. But um, any questions? Should the gift assessment be done before? Should, yes. Should the gift assessment, she's asking, should the gift assessment be done before next week? Yes. Do that by next week. I don't know if we'll hit it next week or the following week, but I think we're going to hit it next week. So do the gift assessment this week and the three chapters with the study questions. Anybody else come in for a different reason than we've talked about, like mentoring or? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I keep forgetting that. I am actually looking for a church slash women's Bible study. Okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good reason. Well, no. We moved out here in July. I lived 32 years in Lake Arrowhead, was a Bible study teacher up there, and came down here and really, I don't know anybody, disconnected, church hopping, mother came to live with us, I thought, temporarily, she died 13 days later, wow. that was February 1st, oh, and I'm, I'm going to be really honest, my name is Nancy, by the way, Hi, Nancy. I spoke to your husband, in fact, the first time I came here, the subject matter was suicide. And I had tied, I got locked up at 5150 hold in January because I couldn't deal with living out here going, God, what did you do bringing me to Marietta when my life is in Lake Arrowhead and I came down here for health reasons and my health is not improving. But I want to mentor people. I've gone through a lot of stuff in my 30 years of knowing the Lord. I have a testimony of once upon a time being a lesbian, and now I'm going to celebrate 38 years of marriage, mm. and that's a miracle. Right. I have a lot to share. Right. And I'm looking for a church, and I really wasn't thinking this was going to be it, because I want to be close to Mary at a five minutes, because as you can tell, I'm late. I was here, what, 20 minutes late? <laughs> going, I didn't Lord, notice. At 9 o'clock, I'm going, Lord, I'm supposed to be in Temecula. I'm not going. My husband's not going to be happy, but he's at work, so he won't know. I'll tell him later. <laughs> Here I am going, oh my gosh, I found my church. Oh, I found my Bible Lord. study. Thank you, God. And thank you. I thank hope you I can help that. somebody. And it's interesting because, you know, what? the things that we go through, the experiences we have, those will minister to somebody else because the things that you've gone through in life, maybe I haven't gone through. And so I can't. I can, I can, I know God's word, and so I can always point someone to God's word, but when you've gone through something, and you've walked in the shoes, how many times have you, like, prejudged somebody about what they're going through, and then you go through the same thing, and you're like, oh, I might send her a card. <laughs> 
because I thought, why didn't you just, you know, look at God's word and then you walk through it and you're like, that's not as easy to walk through when you're the one going through the trial, is it? Much more difficult of a situation. So if I go through something and then you come to me, I know immediately. Now, I might not know. Your story might be different and we have to be careful about just assuming that someone's experience, even though we're going through the same thing, is the same as ours because it might be different, but I can empathize with what you're going through and I may even be able to feel the feelings of what you're going through and then I'm much more effective in maybe... And maybe even pulling tips out of like, well, when I went through this, you know, this is what helped me, and this might help you. There are there are people in our midst. I mean, there is. Um, can I put you on the spot? Um, there are situations where maybe someone might have gone through a molestation or something, you know. Liz has very specific knowledge in certain areas where I might go, Liz, I need you. I need you to come alongside this woman because you know what this is like. There might be other ladies who have gone through, you know, something different. Maybe someone has been raped or someone has had an abortion. I know the ladies in our body to where I can go, okay, this person's dealing with this, and so I want to give you, um, I want to, to hook you guys up, but we can't do that without knowing who each of us are. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'll share my testimony. People are like, I didn't even know, like I would have never known. And when you share your testimony, like who you were before Christ, like people open up. It's like all of a sudden people's guards go down and they're like, oh, you're, you've struggled. You know what it's like to not walk with the Lord. You know what it's like to walk with the Lord. You have been through hard things. I want to talk to you. I want to be able to glean from you. And all of us have different stories. And God places people in the body where he sees fit. And so there, you know, sometimes we come into Sunday mornings and you just see people, but you don't see their stories. And I think as women, you know, I love these classes so much because now I know I have people going out into Sunday mornings and now you're going to look at the people around you a little differently and you're going to reach out and you're going to ask them or you might see somebody um, weeping and you're going to go over and you're going to pray with them or you're going to see that somebody's having a hard time in service and um and you're going to have the boldness where before you might go, uh, you know, I'm not going to go up. You might go up and say, you know what, can I pray for you? I want to tell you a couple things that happened at Easter because it was so amazing just to see the body of Christ working together. There was one person that I guess started to go up and then um, she stopped and she went back and sat down. And one of our members, just someone who's been trained in leadership, came up to this person and said, did you want to go forward? And the person started crying, and they said yes. And that member was able to take that person and walk them forward. There was another one that was an overflow that raised their hand but then didn't come in to the sanctuary. And another member was able to go up to that person and say, did you want, did you want to go to the altar? And they said yes, and they walked them up. And then there was a third person, and this was, this was the most... Um, fascinating one for me there was someone who had gone up but they didn't I don't know if they didn't go up I, don't, I can't remember the details but someone in the aisle texted one of our pastors and said hey there's there's a person in the aisle and they they didn't go up and and then the pastor was like well hold them there until I can get there and talk to them <laughs> and so they're having these like little conversations and then he wanted to get a woman to come with him because it was a girl well he stopped this woman and said hey would you come talk to this person with me there's someone who got saved or whatever brought the woman it ended up being the girl's neighbor who had been witnessing inviting her to church and this girl just burst into tears as soon as they made that connection what an amazing god we serve if we're willing if we're open to open ourselves up to really look around when they're there there's more opportunities for ministry than any of us could ever imagine and he wants to use each and every one of us, not just the pastors, not just the leaders, that he wants to use all of us for the working of the ministry. It, everyone doing their part, that's a healthy church. Everyone doing their part, everyone looking out for each other, everyone teaching each other, encouraging one another, 
So what? So we can have this healthy body and move forward as Christ wants us to move forward. You had a question back there? Um, I came, I moved to this area like 15 months ago. And my mom had moved here about three years ago and she hadn't found a church. And I had just kind of, uh, I had come to the city and my whole life had changed. Uh, I wasn't working, I sold my home, it was just like, it was time to come out here to help my mom and my grandma. They were both out here. Well, since the first thing I did was I found the church and then my mom started coming with me. My duty was to find a church because she hadn't found one in like three years. And I, I'm a very shy, private person and since this year has gone by, I've just grown and I'm putting myself out, you know, doing things that I wouldn't normally do and just meeting just some amazing women that have helped me with this. And I took this class to um, grow in the Lord and be, you know, I had stepped away for a while and I feel really comfortable here, you know. Amen. I really, um, it feels very like family, like, you know. So. Good. But yeah, I, I hope it feels real. You know what I mean? Yeah, because that's yeah. what, that's m my biggest desire is that we would just shed off the pretenses and just like get real. I'm, I love to just sit down and like talk through scripture and talk through like the issues of life and like, let's just be real. You know what I mean? All of us struggle with things and all of us want to learn and all of us want to be equipped and all of us want to grow in the Lord. And I want to do that, um, together. So, um, so welcome all of you, and I hope to get to hear and get to know each one of your stories, and we get to hear from, from each person um, as we kind of go through the class.